this afternoon. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so we were discussing about the micro micro mechanical approach for the single lamina in order to define parameters which can be used for the macro mechanical approach. One moment, I need to activate my pen. Because some problem with my PC, I need to go out and, and then enter again the meeting. Just one moment. Okay. Okay, 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 we can go on. Um, let's hide this one. Okay, so <clears throat> we have seen the basic uh, approach, the basic equation for the estimation of the young modulus in the direction of the fiber alignment and uh, uh, in the at 90 degrees, that is uh, in the transversal direction. Now let's go on with other properties which can be estimated by the micro mechanical approach. And the uh, first one is the Poisson ratio. So if we use this basic scheme, like those reported here in this picture, so we are going to apply a load in the longitudinal direction. We want to understand how we can expect the contraction in the two direction. And this is what is called the, oops, the Poisson, the Poisson modulus, oh. The Poisson modulus knee, one two that is on the one two plane having applied a tensile stress or a tensile load along the direction the principal direction one so the basic definition is always the same i mean the deformation here in the transverse direction is going to be given by the ratio between the displacement delta w uh, on the original length w and so since we are going to have this situation with this is the fiber and this is the matrix uh, we can say that the total displacement uh, in, along the direction number two is given by the sum of the displacement we can expect by, um, in the fiber the displacement we can expect on the matrix and the original length. And this uh, is going to be written in a very simple way, remembering that we know that's our hypothesis, the Poisson ratio of the fiber and the Poisson ratio of the matrix. And we are going to make the hypothesis that the behavior of the single components is uh, an uh, is isotropic behavior because they are homogeneous also in terms of chemical composition and properties. Uh, remembering the uh, relationship 
which is going to exist uh, by the uh, between the transverse deformation of the fiber and the longitudinal deformation of the uh, fiber, the transverse deformation of the matrix and the longitudinal deformation of the fire of the matrix remembering that in this case we are going to apply an iso deformation model so that the basic deformation along the direction number one is the same for the fiber for the matrix and so we can write the original ratio like it is reported here then then this means that if we are going to take WF that is referred to the fiber divided by the original uh, uh, y width of the composites, this is also e equivalent to the percent of volume of the fiber and the same applies to the matrix. We can write the final equation on the basis of the mechanics of materials for the micro-mechanical model uh, for which we are able to estimate, uh, as you see here, the Poisson coefficient uh, in the 1-2 uh, plane, applying a longitudinal load along, that is, the direction number one, as a, a, an, a weighted average uh, of the Poisson coefficient of the matrix, the Poisson coefficient of the fiber, the first one is the fiber, the second one is the matrix, having assumed as weight the percent value of the fiber of the matrix. Always we can remember that there is a, a very simple relationship. <clears throat> According to this relationship, the value of Vf is equal to one minus the value of Vm. Then we can also remember that we do have the general, in the orthotropic case like this one, the general equation that we have seen some slides ago, generally speaking, we can write that the Poisson coefficient or Poisson ratio, they are synonymous in the x, y, that is, for example, one, two direction uh, is equal to the Poisson coefficient in the y, x direction, that is, for example, two, one, multiplied by a x divided by a y, that is, for example, divided by a 1, 2, a 2. And so this means that we can also estimate, you know, uh, when we have estimated the value of ni 1, 2, the value of ni 2, 1, which refers to the application of a tensile load in the two directions uh, in order to have an estimation of the contraction in the one direction. These results that we have obtained here is exactly again another application of the rule of mixer that we have seen for the uh, estimation of the young modulus in the one direction. Uh, and also in this case, uh, with this uh, uh, simple approach, there is a good agreement uh, between the experimental uh, data and between the predicted values by this simple rule of mixture. We can also say that in this special case, uh, the properties, that is Ni 1, 2, is not dominated neither by the matrix, neither by the fiber. Uh, and this is usually because the value of the Poisson ratio for the single coefficient, uh, they are not, not distant uh, between them. I mean, we have seen and we have told many times that the Poisson coefficient generally is around the range between 0 0.25 to 0 0.3. Another uh, uh, property is that we can estimate by using this approach is the shear modulus. And the shear modulus, for example, uh, in the direction like here reported G12. 
This means that in this case, we are going to apply on the one, two plane, and remember one and two are always the principal direction for the single lamina, uh, not a tensile stress, but a shear stress, tau one, two. And so we want to have an estimation of the uh, shear deformation in order to have an estimation of the shear modulus. And since we have made, we have made the hypothesis of perfect bond between the fiber and between the matrix, we can also say that this can be translated in this special case by assuming that the uh, tangential stress in the fiber equal to a general value that we call simply uh, tau. And thus, the uh, shear strain for the two phases considered uh, as singular phase, it, it can be written uh, for what it concerns the matrix by dividing the tangential applied stress for the shear modulus of the, uh, sorry, for the fiber uh, for the matrix by dividing the same stress for the shear uh, modulus uh, of the matrix. And this is the first condition that we can apply. If we go on, then the total displacement, like it was uh, evidenced here in this graph, you see we do have the displacement uh, uh, for what it concerns the fiber and the displacement for what it concerns the matrix. The total displacement is just a sum of the displacement in shear, which is related to the fiber and which is related to the matrix. And so we can write uh, using the general uh, equation uh, that this is equal uh, to uh, the uh, strain in the fiber multiplied by the width of the fiber and the same applies to the matrix and it, this can be condensed in this very simple expression and thus again uh, since we can remember that the ratio like before between the displacement in the fiber divided the original width of the of our system is equal uh, to uh, the volume percent of the fiber, the total shear strain can be written uh, here uh, using again for the total shear strain uh, the rule of mixer, as you see, having used as weight again the uh, volume percent of the two phases. We want, uh, in any case, have an estimation of the shear modulus, and so if we use let me say the hook law in the shear condition, we are not going to write stress equal young modulus multiplied by strain, normal strain, but we are going to write in this case tangential stress equal to shear modulus multiplied by the deformation. So if we make the ratio between gamma and tau, you see this is just equal to the reciprocal value of the shear modulus. And so this is the reason because of we can write this expression, which results with very simple transformation in the uh, final formula for, this, for the estimation of G12, which is following uh, the same, let me say, uh, model that we have found for the estimation of A2, that is the reciprocal of the rule of mixture. And with, with this, we have got another parameter. Uh, for what it concerns, so the, what we have seen now, this is the measure pressure ratio, uh, like we have seen rule of mixture. This is the implant shear modulus, uh, the G12, uh, which follows the reciprocal uh, uh, rule of mixers. But in both this case, as well as we have already seen uh, in the case of the estimation with this approach of the transversal young modulus A2, there is not a very good, let me say, agreement between the experimental measured data and the predicted values by this simple formula. Uh, and so 
we need for a better model. And uh, one of the uh, model which is uh, very often used uh, is the so-called Alpinsai approach. This is a, a semi-empirical approach. What does it mean? That it means that it needs experimental data uh, in order, generally speaking, in order to uh, define better uh, estimation relationship for the transversal properties of the uh, single lamina. And uh, for what it concerns, the eventual application of the Alpinsai equations in the one direction, that is here, in the longitudinal direction, uh, we got the same results uh, that we have defined uh, with the previously used approach. But for what it concerns, the estimation of the transverse young modules, that is A2, uh, the um, Alpine side equation results, uh, without any demonstration at this level, uh, on this, uh, uh, again, simple equation in which you see we have the uh, relationship between A2 and the uh, young modules of the matrix and uh, uh, in which we do have uh, two uh, uh, parameters that we have never met up to now. One is eta, this one, and the second xc, this one, uh, which are combined together with the percent volume of the fiber you can find it also combined with the percent volume of the matrix, again, remembering that Vm uh, is equal to 1 minus Vf. So, what is going to be new uh, in this approach, that we need to know the value uh, of the eta parameter. The value of the eta parameter, which is inside this formula, you see here, is not independent by the parameter xi. And this xi parameter, uh, the relationship is the one written here, is called also the reinforcing factor and essentially depends on the fiber geometry, on the packing geometry, that is of the fiber, and the loading conditions. So we have two, two uh, lines to use these, uh, uh, to use these uh, uh, approach. The first one uh, is to have defined this three main factor and uh, recurring two tables, uh, which give to us a simple relationship uh, in order to estimate the value of C so that we can estimate by this formula the values of eta, so that we can go back and then knowing the value of the young modules of the matrix, calculate by this relationship the uh, transverse young modules of the composite. And this is the case in which we do have, for example, square array uh, where C can be put equal to 2 for the calculation of a 2, and C can be put equal to 1 for the calculation of the shear modulus G12 up to values of percentile uh, reinforcement uh, not higher of 50%. For values uh, which are uh, uh, of VF, which are higher than 0.5, that is 50%, but always in a square array of fibers. Uh, this expression has been suggested. Uh, it is going, uh, it is working quite well uh, in order to have an estimation uh, of the C parameter. If we do not have uh, for other array of fibers, uh, estimations uh, offline, let me say, we need to make some experimental test uh, we need to measure experimentally, that is on a lab scale, the values uh, of A2, and then we can fit the experimental data uh, in order uh, to uh, have the estimation of the C parameter and use, uh, in order to use then 
the equations with the estimation of era uh, and, uh, and thus uh, with the possibility to use more widely and extensively uh, the uh, general formula which are referred to the outside side equations. For these reasons, it is, it is called semi-empirical approach. It's not only, or if you we can say not exclusively uh, a theoretical approach, but it needs experimental data. And with this approach, uh, the uh, as you can see here, the, the uh, experimental data points uh, uh, are going to be better matched. So we are going to have a tool uh, which is uh, able to uh, delete to some extent the underestimation of the transverse young modulus which comes from uh, the uh, classical micromechanical uh, uh, approach that we have seen up to now and this is uh, used this has been uh, has been proved as effective this is another example uh, for example for grass epoxy lamina that is uh, <clears throat> polymeric based uh, matrix composites uh, having uh, an epoxy resin as it is a thermoset as matrix uh, and glass fiber as a reinforcement uh, and also for uh, other uh, cases always always uh, in the case we are uh, still using the, uh, <coughs> the uh, hypothesis that the behavior of our uh, system is linear, linear uh, elastic this concludes the part of the basic part of uh, the lamina uh, reinforced with long fiber. But we can have also, in some cases, the, the necessity to have some modeling and thus some estimation in the case in which we have short, not long, fiber composites. And why this can arise? For different reasons. Uh, one can be related to the fact that uh, most <clears throat> composite materials contain, especially if we are talking about ceramic reinforcement, fibers which do not have a, a uniform strength. And uh, remember the scattering that we can have, even though it is pursued, reduced, but we do have scattering. Uh, in uh, reduced by reducing the size of the materials itself, that is the diameter, in the case of fibers, uh, in the case of ceramic materials. Uh, and so if we do not have a uniform strength of all the fiber, fibers during the loading phase of, of our composite materials, uh, the fibers, some fibers can be broken uh, where, where we have the most severe cracks, pre-cracks, flows, uh, and others still remain long. And so we do have a sort of a, a mixed situation with uh, fibers which are long, so they cover all the length of the component, and fibers which are uh, instead short, that is, they do not cover now, uh, to this definition, all the length of the component. Uh, and uh, we can have also, uh, in the case we use, that is the most common uh, ceramic reinforcing, uh, reinforcing fibers, uh, uh, fracture or damages uh, of the fibers uh, itself uh, before or during the fabrication process. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there is another reason because of, uh, because of uh, we need to mm, go a little bit inside uh, this case, uh, that is that some fiber uh, co reinforced composites uh, for various reasons in principle, for example, for cost, because cost of this uh, ty typology of fibers is less than those of the long fibers, can be fabricated by using short fibers. And so we need to consider what is going to happen, which are the effects of discontinuous fibers on the mechanical properties of a composite. And these are the reasons because of we can and we must discuss, not only because we start at the beginning with short fiber reinforcement, but also because in some cases uh, uh, the uh, 
concept of uh, reduce the length of the fibers, that is short fibers, uh, can uh, be uh, inside the composites or for damages uh, or for uh, due to the uh, non-uniform uh, uniform strength of the fiber itself, especially in the case, uh, as I uh, already told, of ceramic reinforcing fibers. Uh, when the fibers, the, our, let me say this, the, the optimal solution in terms of uh, efficiency of uh, uh, reinforcement is still and again and ever uh, related to the use of long fibers, okay? Uh, but we discuss this uh, and we need to discuss uh, something different uh, is going to happen because when the fibers are not continuous, uh, there is a discontinuity in the strain field uh, which can occur uh, near the fiber ends uh, and uh, in these regions where we have the discontinuity of the strain field, the longitudinal strain carried by the fibers is less than that carrier carried by uh, or supported by uh, the matrix. And so the average strain, which is carried by a discontinuous fiber, is less than the average strain carried by the composite. And thus, the fibers are less effective than when short with respect to the case of continuous uh, stints over a portion, over a part, which can be relevant or not, that depends on the length of the short fiber. Um, they are carrying a reduced tensile load. Uh, and uh, at, this, uh, at this stage, uh, I, I, we need to clarify uh, that there is no, there is no uh, a unique fiber length which is the same for all reinforcing materials below which the fibers can be defined as short. Instead, but we will be back on this concept that we already started some years ago, instead, the fiber length uh, must be put in relationship with a very important parameter, which is called critical fiber length. And this is a parameter that we will see later on, again, how it can be calculated, is a function of the matrix and a function uh, on the, uh, of the reinforcement. And it can vary by uh, changing the type of composites. So, for example, as I wrote here, uh, it, it is possible uh, for, for certain type of fibers in, inside the fine type of matrix materials, it can be possible to say that in that, in that situation, a length of fiber, uh, which is five millimeters, uh, can represent the critical fiber length that is uh, 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 under the value of five millimeters fibers are uh, short and over five millimeter fiber are long, but uh, this can be applied to that specific situation not every time, changing the matrix, changing the material matrix, the material properties, changing the fibers, that is the, the properties of the uh, reinforcement phase, we could get in another situation, in another case, another value of the critical length. Uh, the behavior, in any case, of short fibers or very, very short fibers uh, is dominated by N effects, that is by the effects uh, which are going to happen uh, at the end of the fiber, because we have said before uh, that uh, we have a discontinuity in the strain field near the fiber ends. And uh, uh, so uh, we need to discuss a little bit about this. And uh, uh, in, in the, sorry, okay, about this. Uh, and. Um, this uh, fiber ends effect, uh, when we discussed about the long fiber uh, reinforced composites, uh, such as in the lamina 
um, theory we have discussed up to now, these side effects uh, are not taken into consideration. They are still existing, but they are not so relevant. Uh, but when the aspect ratio, that is the ratio between the length of the fiber and the diameter of the fiber itself is going to decrease, that means if we fix the diameter, we are going to decrease the length, these N effects are uh, more and more significant and the efficiency of the fibers in increasing uh, the uh, young modulus that is stiffening uh, of the matrix is going to uh, decrease. And analytically, but also this has been verified by experimental tests, uh, it has been shown that the tensile stress is zero at the fiber ends and maximum at the center of the fiber. Uh, when we are discussed now. And uh, on, the contrary, on the contrary, the shear stress uh, around the fibers is maximum at fiber ends and for sufficient uh, long fibers, uh, that is for fibers essentially having a length higher than the critical fiber length, uh, this uh, shear stress uh, approaches uh, falls to zero near uh, the center, that is at half the length of the fiber. So we do have this situation. This is a situation for which we have long fiber. And this is the situation for which we do have uh, fibers uh, which are short. And so uh, in the case in which we have short fiber, you see here, uh, we do have uh, a, 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 stress, a strain discontinuity uh, because the fiber is not going to uh, cover all, all the length on the composites. And what we can expect, what we can expect, this is a translation, let me say, of the sentences that we have seen here, is that the, the, the tensile stress in the fiber uh, is going uh, to be transferred uh, by the stresses which is applied to the matrix uh, by the uh, tangential stress uh, which are allocated uh, at the fiber matrix interface uh, so that at the beginning here we can expect very low zero value of tensile stress in the fiber maximum value is something around depending on the length uh, on, on half the fiber oh. and conversely that is uh, on the opposite uh, the maximum uh, shear uh, stress will be at the end because it's shear which is going to transfer tensile stress to the fiber and we fall to something which is uh, approximately near to zero again at the center uh, of the fiber itself. This is a, a sort of a simulation of what uh, we have said before. And you see here, these are experimental that is measured axial strain in the fibers as a function of position along the fiber at different loadings. Different loadings uh, which are defined in this case uh, as the deformation on the matrix. Because if we have this kind of situation, which we are now discussing, that is a fiber which is short, when we apply, let me say, the load, we are going to apply at the beginning the load only to the matrix. And so the, again, with a linear hypothesis in terms of mechanical behavior, uh, we can uh, say that the uh, uh, parameter uh, which is going to give to us an idea uh, of the um, load applied is the deformation of the matrix. So if we are going to increase the value of the strain with the pedix M that is referred to the matrix, this means that we are going to increase the load applied to the fiber, uh, applied to the matrix, to the composites, and then to the fibers. And as you see here, so we are going to increase load uh, in this way. Uh, you see we do have, this is axial strain, we do have a, a part in which uh, the stresses starting from something which is very near to zero, increase in the fiber because this is the profile of the stress on the fiber 
and uh, uh, then it could, that depends on the value of L, be stabilized uh, when we have overcome this uh, final, uh, let me say, uh, this part, which is uh, going to represent uh, the side effect that we have uh, discussed. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, thus, the fiber can be uh, more and more uh, subjected to tensile load, uh, more and more we stress uh, the, the metrics. Uh, the uh, theoretical analysis and the experimental data um, evidence, like it was reported here uh, in, on this graph, you see here, that, that, the, that, that the regions uh, uh, which are, are inside the area in which the, the uh, fiber and effect are going to be present, they do not carry the full load. I mean, they do not uh, stress it to a potential maximum, uh, maximum load. So this means that we have a portion uh, of the fiber which is stressed, you see here, which is stressed a value of, value of stress which are lower than the value of stress uh, which can be considered when we exceed uh, 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 the critical fiber length uh, can be considered constant and thus as consequence as consequence of this the average stress in a short fiber is less than that in a continuous fibers because in our continuous fibers we have not considered the side effects and we have considered the fact that the stress in the fiber is constant in each point of the fiber itself. Even though if we are going to compare this with the same external load applied. And this is also the reason because of the continuous fibers reinforcement is more efficient in terms of increasing the resistance of our lamina because uh, remember that the applied load p not stress the applied load is the sum of the load which is carried by the fiber plus the load which is carried by the matrix and the load which is uh, carried by the fiber is obviously uh, related to the stress in the fiber uh, and to the area of the fiber so if you do have an average stress in the fiber, in the case of short fiber, uh, which is less with respect to the case of continuous fiber, uh, the reinforcement uh, uh, by using the same materials, for example, as reinforcement, but is less efficient in terms of reinforcing the mechanical resistance of the matrix itself. Uh, then there is also uh, another concept that we have to take into account, that, which is uh, stated here, that is the uh, efficiency uh, in terms of reinforcement of fibers depends also on the interface strength, because we have already said, and this is a general concept, the load applied in the matrix is transferred uh, to the fiber by the interface. So we need a strong interfacial bond in this case uh, in order to have the best possible, uh, the best possible uh, transfer mechanism of stress from the matrix uh, to the fiber itself. And if we have very high values of shear stresses at the fiber matrix interface, uh, we can expect or we can have uh, some uh, undesirable effects like, for example, interfacial shear debonding, that is fracture huh, at the interface, uh, or we can have matrix failure, for example, uh, or it depends on the materials composition of the matrix, that's a general uh, concept, uh, we can have also matrix yielding, uh, that is, uh, a plastic deformation uh, uh, on the matrix. This can happen also in the case we are going to discuss uh, polymeric matrix composites. Uh, if our matrix uh, is not a thermo set resin but is a thermoplastic uh, resin, uh, if for example uh, the uh, resin is going to work 
at a temperature value which is higher than the Tg value of the resin, for which, remember, in the case of thermoplastic, we have a quite relevant number of weak bone uh, which are broken, uh, and so we can have also uh, something which is uh, uh, modeled as plastic deformation of the matrix itself. Uh, in, a, in a composite, uh, where uh, the fiber are uh, continuous uh, in uh, one direction, uh, for example, they do not end inside the composites, the stress on the fiber can be predicted uh, uh, quite easily by the rule of mixer. And this is the first approach that we will see. Uh, if the fiber are, are shorter than the length of the composites, they are discontinuous, uh, and uh, the rule of mixture may not necessarily predict very well the fiber stress. And in this case, in this case, uh, which is the case that we will discuss later on, and now, from now on, sorry, the stress on the fiber will depend on the length of the fiber, will depend on the elastic and eventually, as we said before, plastic properties, uh, Essentially, that's a general formulation, it's written also fibers, but if we want to specialize in our sector of PMC, essentially of the matrix, the uh, shear strength of the matrix, or as an alternative, that's the failure mechanism uh, which is going to happen, is those uh, which is the uh, weakest one, the, the interfacial debonding, that is uh, the value of the interfacial shear strength, uh, the value of the shear stress, uh, which is necessary to debond at the interface, uh, the fiber matrix uh, coupling. Uh, let's start from this case. And uh, uh, let's think to uh, apply a tensile load to a discontinuous fiber line. Uh, and uh, since the matrix, uh, that's a real case, uh, has a lower modulus with respect to the fibers, uh, the longitudinal strain in the matrix, uh, the longitudinal strain in the matrix is higher than that in the fiber itself. And uh, if we assume, as we do, that a perfect bond is existing between the fibers and uh, between the uh, matrix, the difference, uh, the difference uh, in longitudinal strains uh, can give rise to shear stress distribution across the fiber matrix interface, which is graphically represented uh, in, uh, in, in this, let me say, picture. Uh, if we, for a moment, ignore that is, um, we are not going to consider the stress transfer at the fiber and cross section uh, uh, and the interaction between uh, neighboring fibers, because we do not have only one fiber, obviously, uh, we can be able to calculate the normal stress distribution uh, on, uh, on, uh, in a continu discontinuous fibers by using a very simple uh, equilibrium approach, uh, equilibrium approach which is made as usually on load, that is on force, like written here. So that, for example, uh, if we are going to take the situation in which uh, we do have a lamina, lamina, that's the simple case that can be treated very simply analytically uh, with discontinuous fibers, uh, but the unidirectional, that is all the fibers, even though they are discontinuous, uh, not going uh, through all the length of our composites, but they are aligned in the same direction. Uh, and uh, the concept that uh, the uh, the uh, tensile stress in the fiber arises uh, by uh, the coupling in shear with the course at interface is uh, existing. 
uh, and uh, then we can try to uh, put our attention uh, on a, a single element of the fiber, uh, making uh, the force equilibrium uh, and uh, thus trying to understand what, what is going to up uh, in terms of uh, stresses which are existing inside the fiber itself. And so having in mind this scheme, if we make our, our force equilibrium, we do have for an infinitesimal length dx uh, at a distance x from one fiber ends, we do have uh, the two values uh, of normal load, this one and this one, because we have this situation as it was written before, this is the stress sigma plus the sigma. And here we have the stress sigma. And so we do have also the stress tau on the lateral surface. Uh, and thus the increase uh, in uh, infinitesimal increase uh, in the stress the sigma is made, uh, is made possible by the existence of uh, uh, a, a tangential shear uh, stress, which is called tau. So the general equation of the equilibrium can be written like this. You see, just multiplying in a very simple approach, uh, the stresses for the reference surface. In the case uh, of the normal stress, this is the reference surface, that is uh, the fiber cross section. In the case of shear stress, this is the reference surface that is uh, the uh, lateral uh, uh, surface of the uh, small elements, infinitesimal elements uh, of the uh, fiber itself. And uh, if we use this approach uh, by simplifying the terms which are present here, we get uh, to the uh, final differential equation which is, which is given and written here. So if we uh, make an integral uh, of this, of this, we can write the integral like this one. Mm -hmm. uh, so with extremes which are uh, defined um, like uh, written here. Uh, and we are not assuming in this case, you see, it's written here, that there is a stress transfer at the fiber heads. Huh? So if we assume this, uh, we can define that the initial stress value uh, of the uh, fiber itself, uh, that is at the fiber end, is equal to zero. Okay. And then in order uh, to uh, make this integral, uh, we need to know which is the dependence of the tangential stress by the length, that is by our uh, independent variable, which is x. Because we can write, having put the value uh, at x well, uh, uh, for x equal to zero of sigma f uh, equal to zero, okay? So we just need to make the integral of the sigma uh, between zero and sigma f with this hypothesis. Uh, we need to know how the shear stress uh, is linked to the independent variable, independent variable x, which is the length, the increasing length of the fiber itself. Uh, let's make a simple analysis uh, and uh, using the so-called Kelly-Tyson model which uh, starts from this assumption, which is not always true, but it is able to give to us some significant results and consideration. That is uh, the hypothesis uh, related to the fact that the shear stress is constant and we call it this value equal to tau uh, with uh, the pedix i. This is, I repeat, the kelly tyson model. So making tau constant equal to tau, uh, tau with i, which is uh, essentially the shear strength of the fiber matrix interface. Uh, making the hypothesis, uh, if this is the total length of the fiber, okay, that the shear stress is constant, obviously, uh, this means that the shear stress, for example, 
uh, it has uh, an inversion point at the middle center of the length that is at L -L LF divided by two, uh, again for equilibrium, uh, force equilibrium uh, region. But if tau is constant and equal to, uh, to tau with i, uh, the integral becomes very simple. And the final formulation uh, with which we can define how the tensile stress inside a short fiber uh, is going to be modified by moving the value of x, that is by moving uh, along the length of the fiber, is just defined like uh, it is written here. Uh, so this is essential, a linear relationship between the value of the tangential stress uh, and the tensile stress in the fiber, which depends on the fiber diameter, okay? And the maximum fiber stress occurs at the central portion of the fiber where we do have the inversion of the tensile of the shear, the shear applied stress, because this is our hypothesis uh, to make the distribution of the uh, shear stress constant here for example, positive, here, for example, negative, and at the fiber center, we do have the inversion, a discontinuous inversion uh, uh, here, that is, in this point, the tangential stress is, uh, let me say, flow uh, it, it is equal uh, to zero, or it has a discontinuity, going to the maximum value with a plus sign to the minimum value, which is in modulus the same of maximum, but with a, with a minus uh, sign. And so, the maximum values of the stress in the fiber can be written, you see, like this, because if we uh, uh, calculate the value of sigma uh, f, that is stress in the fiber for x equal to the uh, half length of the fiber, f, f div uh, divided by 2, we just obtain this expression, okay? Uh, then, if we are again using, like in the long fiber case, we are, I repeat, in this situation, is continuous, but they are all aligned. Uh, we are going to use, for example, the hypothesis of isostrain conditions. Uh, then we do have also, according to what we have seen, uh, this uh, uh, general situation, which can put in relationship uh, the uh, stress acting on the composite materials uh, with the modulus of the composite, the fiber, and the stress in the fiber. Uh, and uh, when the value of the uh, stress in the fiber get close, that is, is going to approach this limiting value, which can be uh, calculated, the fiber length, LF, at the same time, gets close to the value which represents the load transfer strength, which is also defined as LT, length of the fiber, which corresponds to the load tra transfer strength, which means we have reached the maximum stress in the uh, fiber, discontinuous uh, fiber. And so this load transfer length represents the minimum fiber length in which the maximum fiber stress in the fiber, obviously, is achieved. And it, tell, it can be also calculated according to, uh, to the previous equation by uh, substitution by this uh, simple uh, formula. Uh, uh, in which we can see uh, that the uh, value of LT depends also on the applied stress, okay? This is the situation which represents, let me say, a graphical uh, representation, the previous formula, uh, uh, in which we do uh, have the possibility to uh, have the uh, constant, let me say, 
part of a constant part of the um, a part of the fiber which is uh, um, under a constant value of the uh, tensile stress uh, with the as I wrote as, as before I, I, I draw to you uh, the hypothesis of the uh, shear applied uh, or the shear existing at the interface uh, uh, which is considered a, a constant. Uh, if we use this expression which we have defined by uh, let me say specializing uh, uh, the stress of the fiber and putting this stress equal to the uh, mm -hmm ultimate stress of the fiber, that is the tensile strength of the fiber. And uh, if we define the shear stress, like, for example, the shear strength of the interface, we get, we get the expression that we have already used uh, of the so-called fiber critical length, which represent the key point for which we can divide long fiber from short fiber. Because when we are going to achieve the critical fiber length, as you can see here, even though, again, by the side effect, uh, the uh, average stress here is lower than the average stress in the fiber that we can have in the case of long fiber reinforcement. But when we, when we uh, uh, um, have fibers having a length equal to the critical fiber strength, we are able by this simple uh, described transfer mechanism to reach the ultimate tensile strength of the fiber. Obviously, this applies also for uh, length of fibers which are higher than the critical fiber length. When we have fibers uh, having a length which uh, is lower than the critical fiber length, we are not able to reach the ultimate tensile stress of the fiber by this transfer mechanism because it's this one and we stop to the uh, stress tensile in the fiber to this level and we reach instead as critical failure mechanism the maximum value which is tolerated by the interface that is the sheer strength of the interface. And so uh, this concept also tells to us and remember to us what we already have discussed uh, some time ago, that if we have fibers having a length which is higher than the critical length, we can have rupture of the fiber. When we have length which are lower than the critical length, we, we do have not rupture of the fiber, but we have, for example, pull out of the fiber. And so in this case, in this case, it's obviously like the situation most effective with respect to this one, because we are using the high strength resistance of the fibers itself, even though, even though, even though, uh, let me say, uh, when we consider the load transfer mechanism, the average stress of, on the fiber is always lower than that we do have in long fiber reinforced, with, not with discontinuous, depending this difference by the effective length of the fiber itself because you see here because you see here by increasing the value of the length of the fiber and by entering uh, the area of the uh, fiber having a length higher than the critical fiber length the average stress inside the fiber is moving moving up 
and the reduction due to this mechanism uh, of transfer by at the end is as lower influence. So if we want to resume in this case, when we have a length of fiber which is lower than the critical fiber length, the maximum fiber stress may never reach the ultimate fiber strength. And in this case, either the fiber matrix interfacial bond or eventually that it, it could be possible eventually, huh? but usually the most weak area is the interface, but generally speaking, if the interface has been designed to be a little bit stronger than the uh, uh, matrix, then in this case we do have uh, that um, the rupture is localized at the interface or eventually the matrix may fail before fibers achieve their potential strength. When we do have length of fiber which are uh, higher than the critical fiber length, the maximum fiber stress may reach the ultimate fiber tensile strength over much of its length, increasing this length uh, in which we can have the ultimate fiber tensile stre uh, stress uh, and reaching the strength uh, for LF value uh, as the LF value are higher than the LC value. But however, on an over a distance equal to half length uh, of the fiber, uh, from each end, the fiber remains less effective hmm, because the average stress is lower. For effective fiber reinforcement, thus, uh, it is necessary to use fibers uh, uh, in order to uh, use and to uh, take advantage uh, by their strength. And so we must select a length of fiber, which is uh, sensibly, sensibly higher than the critical uh, fiber length. And for a, fi uh, a given fiber diameter and strength, the value of the critical uh, fiber length can be also controlled by controlling, that is increasing or decreasing, uh, the value of the uh, tau with i, pedix i, that is the resistance, uh, that's the most, as I told to you, uh, most often case uh, going to happen, the resistance of the interface. So if we design the interface and we design the, the resistance and the shear strength of the interface, we can also control the value of the uh, critical fiber length. And when we uh, discussing, we were discussing about uh, ceramic matrix composites and told that we can design a weak bonding at the interface, this means essentially that we are going to design a production technology with uh, the fine materials for the fiber for the matrix, uh, eventually with pre-treatment pre of the fiber surface or with modification on the matrix composition, which uh, is able to result to diff in different value of the uh, shear strength of the interface. Uh, in the case we have uh, lamina, again, as we are discussing, uh, with the unidirectional discontinuous fibers, we can have also an estimation uh, of uh, the expected of the expected value of the resistance uh, in the longitudinal direction, that is uh, in the direction of fiber ligament. Okay, again this one uh, by using this concept, and we need to uh, take care uh, that the. Uh, general expression, I have not recalled to you this general expression when we talk about uh, long uh, fiber reinforced, but it's quite uh, simple to remember because we discussed it here, it's a role mission for the resistance some uh, in the last courses, but in any case, uh, it tells to us that the uh, resistance of the composites in the longitudinal direction can be estimated uh, as the resistance of the fiber 
multiplied with the transcise strength of the fiber, the volume percent of the fiber, plus the stress in the matrix, which is called, and now we'll be more clear, sigma 1m, uh, multiplied by Bm, that is 1 minus Bf. And this stress in the matrix, in the usual, not the all because uh, all it is, but the usual case in which we will have uh, that the maximum strain in the fiber at rupture condition is lower than the maximum strain in the matrix in uh, breaking condition of the matrix. That is the situation which is always re referred as brittle fiber and uh, ductile matrix. Mm? In this case, this value of sig 1m uh, is equal to the young, with a linear elastic modulus, to the young modulus of the matrix uh, multiplied by the first strain of rupture, that is the strain of rupture of the fiber. And this is the general let me say expression, which is valid for long fiber reinforced lamina. And now we see here that we are going to make our hypothesis corresponding to reality with the hypothesis of the micromechanical approach we had defined, uh, for which the stress in the fiber is a stress which is equal to the rupture stress in all cross section of the fibers without size effects. But when we are going to enter in the case of discontinuous, even though they are unidirectional, we cannot put here in the rule of measure directly the value of the uh, tensile strength of the fiber, because the average, the average stress in the fiber which is going to let us to calculate the load which is carried by the fibers is lower for the side effect uh, uh, in the case of discontinuous fibers with respect to continuous one. And so we need to, and this is uh, the value of what we have called in my written sigma f, we need to take into account the effective length of the fiber compared with the critical length of the fiber. And so the, the, in the case that we do have a length of fiber which is higher than the critical length, and we can reach, this means, the ultimate and size strength of the fiber, we need to uh, use the, this correction, which comes very simply from this integral, in order to have the representation of the average stress uh, over the fiber length. Uh, and as you see here, uh, uh, this ratio has a minus before, so this is always something one minus a positive value. Again, we have a demonstration on uh, the fact that the discontinuous fibers uh, they strengthen the matrix lower than, uh, lower than the, you know, that is to a lesser degree than continuous fibers. When we do have instead values of length of fibers which are lower than the critical fiber length, there is no fiber failure. Why? Because we have said before that we can have the bonding. We do not reach the value of uh, sigma fu in this case, as we have seen. And so the lamina, the lamina primarily uh, can uh, fail uh, by matrix tensile failure. And since the average tensile stress in the fiber, we have seen it before, is equal to this one, then the longitudinal tensile strength of the composite in the case in which we have fiber length, which are lower than the critical fiber length, can be written it, like in this way. We do have always this, the tensile part, which is given uh, by uh, the matrix when considered, let me say, alone. But then we do have also uh, the part, which is 
supported by the fiber, uh, which uh, is directly, as you see here, referred to the resistance of the interface, because this is the weak point since we do not reach uh, the uh, ultimate and size strength of the fiber uh, itself. And this is the relationship, these are sorry, the relationship which can allow to us to have an idea uh, of the longitudinal tensile strength of lamina with uh, unidirectional reinforced uh, discontinuous fibers in the two cases. In the cases in which we have fiber length higher than the critical and more, is the fiber, more higher is the fiber length, more effective is the reinforcing, uh, let me say, effect. Uh, and in the case in which we do have fiber length, uh, which is lower than the critical fiber length, uh, in this case, uh, the, uh, the uh, failure mechanism is essentially controlled by matrix and by the interface between, uh, between matrix and fiber, and we do not never reach the ultimate uh, tensile strength of the fiber itself. Uh, strictly speaking, uh, to be precise, uh, all what we have uh, said up to now uh, can be considered, uh, let me say, representative uh, of uh, the an estimation approach. Remember, uh, only if we have, uh, we can make the assumption that we have made that the uh, shear stress at the interface uh, uh, can be considered as a constant value. And uh, this, this, this case, uh, the case in which we are allowed to make this hypo hypothesis, uh, is, is essentially related to the case in which uh, we do have a good tile matrix that go inside the yielding phenomena due to high shear stresses in the interfacial zone between obviously fiber and matrix between uh, before uh, the matrix uh, bond fails, uh, the fiber matrix bond fails. And then we can have some uh, plastic, uh, let me say, uh, flow without essentially no strain hardening, that is, a, it corresponds to a perfect elastoplastic uh, model. Uh, when uh, this cannot be applied, that is when we are not allowed, which is most of cases in our, uh, in our combination of fiber and matrix for composites of our interest, uh, and so we are not allowed to make the hypothesis that the uh, shear stress at the interface uh, is uh, constant, but it varies with the variable x. Well, there, there are other models which can be used. I just want to mention to you one of the most known, uh, which is the model, which is the model defined by Cox, which is also which is also uh, named as shear leg analysis or shear leg uh, theory. Uh, again, here, uh, without going inside uh, the demonstration, just remember that uh, the, uh, this shear leg analysis, the shear leg theory, uh, allow to us to have, which is our problem essentially in these cases, uh, uh, a mathematical formula for the estimation of the fiber stress distribution along the length of the fiber, and we are still discussing in the case of discontinuous fibers, which is uh, represented by these expressions, uh, where you can see here, uh, we have known parameter, uh, for example, the fiber modulus, for example, the longitudinal strain in the composites, but we do have also another parameter here represented, apart the trigonometric function, which is beta, uh, uh, which is given by the matrix shear modulus, modulus the fiber radius, radius and the uh, center to center distance from a fiber to its nearest neighbor which is called 2R. What does it mean? If we have this kind of arrangement, 
this is the center to center distance, hmm? which is called 2R, okay? Where R is the parameter which is present here. Thus, this means with this shear leg analysis, where we are going not to make the hypothesis that the value of the shear stress is constant, but the values of shear stress depends by the variable x, the estimation of the stresses in the fibers uh, is given by this expression. Why we have half of the length of the fiber? Because again, we do have stresses we are going to be, which are going to increase by the end, and then reaching, let me say, possibly, depending on the length, the maximum and the center, and then going again uh, at the fiber end at zero value. Okay. Uh, this is the representation, and you see here, this is the case in which uh, the hypothesis uh, for the distribution of the shear uh, stresses at the fiber matrix interface on, on, the, on, the, on the fiber surface is not considered like uh, those we have defined before, that is this one and this one but it's considered varied uh, and varying and this variation is again also here uh, depending on the beta coefficient. This is the shear leg, the shear leg uh, theory uh, uh, in which we can make uh, a refinement of our uh, calculation uh, in order to take into account also also the uh, possibility to uh, uh, overcome the limitation given by the hypothesis of a shear uh, stress constant on the, on the interface. Uh, then, uh, when we want to make estimation uh, of uh, the uh, modulus, for example, uh, in the case of uh, an unidirectional discontinuous fiber, uh, zero lamina, that is in a lamina, which is uh, as again all the uh, all the uh, fiber oriented uh, and oriented on the principal direction uh, one, all these uh, uh, expressions uh, we have seen up to now uh, result with some not very complicated demonstration, but I will never ask to you this kind of demonstration. Just remember that we do have formula in this case in the possibility to define the value of the A1 modulus. Here it is called A11, but this means A1, A1 that is in the direction one, uh, which is uh, given uh, by the expression here reported, uh, where we do have the parameter eta, hmm, eta L, uh, the transverse modulus, the shear modulus, the Poisson uh, ratio, uh, for what it concern, uh, one two direction and the two one direction is a general formulation we have seen before, uh, where the parameters which are re reported uh, in that previous formula uh, they are defined like this: eta l, eta t, eta g, depending uh, on the fiber uh, properties such as length, diameter and Young modulus and matrix properties uh, such as Young modulus of the, of the matrix, uh, obviously modulus generally speaking, uh, which are uh, <coughs> which are uh, turned to be the shear modulus of the uh, matrix in the case uh, we are going to define the transversal direction. And uh, this is the results which is obtained coupling also uh, the approach of the uh, micromechanical of, of this continuous reported fiber, again with the Alpine Psi equations defined and applied uh, in the case uh, of uh, discontinuous uh, reinforcement. Uh, and this is going to work quite well. This is an example, just to give to you an, some example. Uh, in the case we have 35% of, of uh, reinforcing fibers. Uh, uh, nylon uh, 6x uh, uh, plastic uh, in a uh, rubber uh, matrix, uh, nylon fiber reinforcing. And you see here experimental data 
and uh, equations uh, obtained by these coefficients, which are here, okay, uh, coefficient uh, present in the output side equation, which allow to us to have a, a set of simple formula to have an estimation of, uh, of uh, uh, the modulus in the one direction. There are, and with this we can conclude today, hypotheses uh, for which this formula can be used. They are listed here. Most of them are already, uh, we already discussed bef before. Um, and uh, there are also some, let me say, uh, conditions uh, for which, for the out inside, we can, uh, uh, we can define the values of C by formula for 1, 1, or for, uh, for 2, 2, that is for a 2, or for G, 1, 2. Uh, in, in the case, we have a circular fiber like this, uh, spherical reinforcement, uh, and uh, uh, usually uh, a square array. So we uh, have uh, in our hand uh, possibility uh, to have an estimation in the case also of discontinuous fibers. Um, to complete, to complete uh, this uh, uh, micro-mechanical approach for uh, short and discontinuous fibers, we need to discuss uh, what we can expect uh, in terms of uh, properties defined uh, uh, or associated to the case in which we are here. Let me take the picture, okay, here, that is in the case in which we have randomly oriented short fiber, but we will uh, see the relationship uh, that have been derived and then tested also experimentally uh, in the, the next lesson, so which, is, which will be next Friday. And uh, for today, we can close the lessons. So if somebody has questions, please, just ask. Okay, if no questions, we will meet again next Friday. Bye bye to all.